please welcome to Kerrang! in conversation with, from Rage Against the Machine, Prophets of Rage, Audio Slave, and many solo yeah. projects, this man here, Mr. Tom Morello. Hello, Sam. Hello. Gentle folk. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, thank you. What's going on? Welcome. Thank nice you very much here. for coming. Yes. In the belly of metal, Kerrang. I like it. <laughs> I like it a lot. I like that, that nickname. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, um, so let's talk by talk, start by talking about what you're up to right now. You're here sure. to talk about um, the Atlas Underground, your new That's thing. That's correct. Uh, it's got... A shitload is the correct metric term of yes, guests on it. Yes, um, yes. If what, there are, the if there are 20 or more guests on a record, it qualifies as a shitload. So yeah. that's a <laughs> <laughs> and we're right at the 20 mark, so I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's accurately described. Yeah, my idea with the Atlas Underground record, it's a solo record, but I was also curating a sonic conspiracy uh, between these diverse artists from rock, punk, metal, and EDM to make... The idea was to make a hybrid, a brand new kind of genre of music that combines my Marshall Stack Fury and rock riffs and crazy soloing with some huge bass drops. That's the, uh, that's the idea. And, um, you know, and to that end, I was working in the EDM world with Knife Party and Bass Nectar and Pretty Lights and Steve Aoki and uh, Fantagram and Bauer, uh, but also with old friends Wu-Tang Clan and new friends Big Boy and Killer Mike. Uh, and Rise Against, and Portugal the Man, and Liska, am I at 20 yet? <laughs> I'm near 20, but uh, uh, anyway, so a real labor of love, love I've been kind of uh, working on in secret over the course of the last couple of years, you know, in and out of working with Prophets of Rage, and it has come to fruition, and it comes out October the 12th. Well plugged. There you go. Well, yeah. so I did, did fly 6,000 <laughs> miles, so I thought I'd tell you when the record's out, is that all right? <laughs> So where did your idea to, to my create? entirely all male fan base here, with the exception of the exception of I think the camera, perhaps the camera woman here. I don't know. What this was like the ratio at every Rage Against the Machine show, by the way. <laughs> I, have a, I hope it improves once the Portugal the Man song comes out. <laughs> Let me just put that out there. All right. <laughs> oh, hello. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, cheers, cheers, cheers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be bashful now. Feel, feel to, to intermingle. So, where did the idea to do this thing and create your own genre come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've always like hated EDM music, and uh, uh, and I always lo thought of it like as Italian taxi cab music <laughs> or or Ibiza drug music, none of which appealed to me. Uh, but a metal friend of mine turned me on to a group called Knife Party, and I heard in their music the same kind of volume, power, tension, and release of like my favorite rock and roll and metal songs. And I thought, I, the, the light bulb went off and I said, well, what if we replace some of their synthesizers with my Marshall Stack guitar playing? That might be a thing. Um, and the, the seed for that was planted years ago. I did a song with Prodigy y many years ago. Uh, and it, it, the seed was planted then. I just thought like, this is something that hasn't been explored. Yeah, there have been some electric records that had guitar on them. Yes, there's some, been some sort of Frankenstein together mashups, but nobody's really gone for it in a way that was uncompromising in the rock and roll element, but that also was fearless in kind of reaching into the future. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, how did you actually start work on it? Because yeah, it seems yeah. like it's, even though there's a lot of people on it, it's very much your own thing. Sure, well. sure, sure. Like I said, my job, in, in addition to being like sort of guitarist and songwriter, being the curator was really the, the main task, which meant kind of rounding up new friends and old friends uh, to make this record. And so the songs were written in very different ways. Like, you know, Wu-Tang Clan, or Riz and Jizza came over to my studio uh, to record. Gary Clark Jr. came over to my studio. But other groups, it was like, uh, you know, like Mark, Marcus Mumford and I, you who are both rock dads. You know, like he would he was in England and he'd put his kids to bed here and I was in LA and I'd drop my kids off at school there and then we'd return to our Skype, you know, with our acoustic guitars and our dad robes and like write a song <laughs> together. Uh, um, and then and then other times like the, the the thing that was most interesting and challenging was taking some of the EDM acts like Steve Aoki and Knife Party and I would I have this big stockpile of riffs in my like a bank of riffs, and I would send them maybe 10 and go, okay, take these and, and use these as the sonic building blocks, but do what you do with them as a starting point. Cool. And, um, and obviously, Rage famously boasted that 
uh, first record was made using guitar, yes. drums, bass, and a voice. Yes. Uh, so quite the change of pace. Yes, well, I made 16 of those records with Rage <laughs> and August Slave <laughs> and The Night Watchman and Street Sweeper and Bruce Springsteen. So, uh, yeah, it was really like, you know, I've been making records since 1992, and, and I wanted to do some as a guitarist, I wanted to challenge myself and to really make this new alloy of something. You know, I'm a fan of, a huge fan of rock and roll and of heavy rock and roll, and I wanted to be uncompromising on that front, but I also wanted it to be not just not just another record of me playing guitar. It had to be more than that. Yeah, cool. And um, was there anyone that you wanted to get in on it that just couldn't make it happen? Yeah, I mean, there, there, was, there was some artists, but, but I'm already half through making the next record now, too. <laughs> so there's, a, there's about six or seven songs in the can, so there's, uh, you know, there's a spillover that will, there'll be more songs coming. And when you, you know, you've started a lot of new things. <laughs> um, you know, you've done this, you've done The Night Watchman, you've done Prophets of Rage, yeah, and all yeah. those things. Yeah. Um, I mean, how does it feel to start all over again when you are like a, a sort of a known quantity? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's to me, it's like that's the exciting part of the journey is when you do something that doesn't feel it's sort of like outside of your safety zone. You know, as an artist, that's where you feel. I feel like I'm growing. You know, it's one thing to, you know, I love playing with Prophets of Rage and we get to rock the PE catalog and the Cypress catalog and the Rage catalog and a little bit of the Audio Slave catalog as well as our own songs. But this is something that feels like bold and new and super exciting to me. When you started uh, Audio Slave after Rage, you know there there was a thing, it wasn't just you who was the known quantity involved. Sure. There were three other people. Three other known quantities. Really yeah. known people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, was that weird? Sort of going into uh, you saying like out of your safety zone and your comfort zone. Yeah. Was that? Did, what, did, was it quite weird going into it where everyone was known for their individual thing? Sure, sure. I mean, it was a, uh, you know, I imagine like when I first was in a band that I would be in one band for my whole life. You know, that's sort of, I, Im I imagine, you know, I'd make 20 records with one band, that would be it. But it didn't work out that way. But what it has, while that's not a thing that happened, what has happened is it provided these incredible experiences to play with. Like the front men that I've played with are Zach De La Rocha, Chris Cornell, uh, Bruce Springsteen, you know, Chuck D and, and be real. And like, that's a pretty solid lineup right there. Yeah. I mean, that's like a Mount Rushmore of awesome <laughs> front men right there. You know? So, uh, so I feel, really feel blessed for that. But you know, when we formed Audio Slave, uh, you know, with Tim and Brad and I and Chris, it was, again, it was, it was stepping into the unknown because we had, it, 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 it pushed us in a more kind of melodic direction and making, you know, and working with Chris's incredible, Vocalist, I think he's one of the greatest rock singers of all. Certainly the greatest rock, certainly the greatest rock singer of his generation. One of the greatest rock singers of all time, um, and melody creator and songwriter. Uh, that that was it was a great honor and and really pushed my playing in other directions. You know, then I did like the Night Watchman records, which was acoustic Americana radical folk music, which was again stepping out of my safety zone. And then there's playing with Bruce, where I had to learn you know 270 songs, which was there's nothing safe about that. You know. Uh, and then Prophets of Rage and this. So like, I really love the being able to pivot and constantly challenge myself as a guitarist and as an artist. Cool. I was playing with Bruce. Um, was, was that different again? Because you're not the main dude sure. on the stage. There is Bruce Springsteen and sure. everyone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I've, uh, one thing I was confident that I would, or I was fairly certain that I would never be in my life as a side man. I just thought that's not a, that's not, that's, some people love that gig. I like to have my hands on the steering wheel. Uh, but the only person that I would be a side band for is Bruce Springsteen, who I'm, <laughs> you know, they don't call him the boss for nothing. That guy knows what he's doing, you know, and, and I was, uh, I was, and I still am a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. So what an honor it was over the course of about six years to play with uh, him and the E Street Band. So he's a good boss then? Let me tell you, he's pretty great. His, his, the one thing that I noticed that I realized, which I suspected, but there was a kinship in a way, and that um, I've always felt that whenever I write a song, whenever I record a song, whenever I perform a song, that I do it with a like a full commitment. And you know, I, I'm not just playing a song because I have a gig here tonight. I'm playing a song to save the soul of everyone in the room. Like you know, you know and that's a just a, it's just a different way of looking at your life and what you do for a living. And Bruce, clearly, let me tell you, I can. I can tell you he's right there uh, with that. So, you know, we would play shows everywhere around the world, and you'd see fans who would travel to every show, and they're very excited to see Bruce Springsteen. You'd see fans who had never seen him before, been waiting their whole lives. They're very excited to be in the room. But no one is more excited to be in that room than Bruce Springsteen on every given night. So. Cool. And um, so when you, you know, going back a bit, um, the Bruce Springsteen obviously – Big influence, big guy. Mm -hmm. When you were, you know, starting out as a young guitar player, yep. who were your main kind of influences and heroes and sure. people like that? 
Well, it, what got me interested in rock and roll was like hard rock. It was Kiss and Led Zeppelin and ACDC and Black Sabbath and you know, it was parking lot, suburban parking lot metal. That was the, uh, <clears throat> that was the totality of my record, co record collection. Uh, but it was, it was unattainable. You know, as a teenager in a basement in suburban Illinois, you know, you're, I was admiring these guys that had castles on Scottish locks and, <laughs> you know, $10,000 Les Pauls. I didn't have any of that. I had a basement in suburban Illinois. Like, that's all I had. So it was punk rock for me, which was the revelation. And it was the Sex Pistols and the Clash. And it was, it, I bought the Sex Pistols cassette and I was in a band within 24 hours of buying the cassette. I didn't know how to play a note or a chord on the guitar, but I knew that I was in a band. <laughs> <laughs> and I went into the drama club at Libertyville High School, and I just said, a band is forming. The first three people that raise their hands are in it. <laughs> no experience required. Uh, and that was, uh, that was my first band, which featured, crazily, Adam Jones from Tool was in that band as well. <laughs> Believe it or not. Small world. Yeah. And um, small world. So when did you start? His hand went up. Quit. <laughs> 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 when did you start sort of developing your guitar style? So obviously there's a lot of sort yeah. of classic guitar hero stuff in there, yeah. like Malmsteen and people like that. Yeah, it was it was uh, the, the the unique guitar style happened later. But once I I began playing with punk rock, but I was very much a a, a child of that '80s shredder gunslinger mentality where you didn't want to be. Uh, great guitar player, you wanted to be better than that guy. You know, like yeah. that was it. Uh, so I, I started at 17, which was very late. I had never, never n heard of a guitar player that began playing that late that I had their album. So I was behind. But I do have, fortunately, I have an obsessive compulsive disorder. So I was able to practice a lot. And, uh, you know, for a while I was practicing eight hours a day, 365 days a year. And that amassed a certain amount of technique that allowed me to approximate the you know, the Ingves and the Eddie Van Halens and the Randy, Randy Rhodeses, whose shirt I'm sporting right now. Um, but I was becoming a technically accomplished musician without becoming an artist. And there's two, you're musicians, there's artists. It was really during the um, formation of Rage Against the Machine where I began looking at the instrument in a different way, and I was the DJ in the band. And my sonic responsibilities went beyond chords and, you know, shredding notes. Uh, and I just looked at it like the... Electric guitar is a brand new, fairly new instrument on the planet. It's a piece of wood. It's six wires, some electronics. And those sounds, those things can be manipulated in a lot of different ways to create unusual sounds that can be the building blocks for rock and roll. And once I, once I had that revelation, I was off to the races, and I never looked back. And I, it, I was, it was my voice. It was my own lane. There was no one else in that lane. I was like, I'm just going to create my ass off now and combine my... Black Sabbath riffs, which this crazy R2-D2 <laughs> cow mooing, duck quacking, <laughs> you know, craziness that uh, really felt like home. And, uh, there's a story, though, that that didn't always go so well with the uh, some of the new techniques. There's a story I think you told about playing at Reading and not realizing oh, geez. Oh, geez. Yeah, that, that the went UK horribly. has different electricity. Yeah, 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 that went horribly. So one of my, you know, one of my big showstopper moments was uh, I would pull the jack out of the guitar and it you can touch it to like the metal on the guitar and it would create like sort of a, a grounding noise which then i would manipulate with the wah-wah pedal and this is very magical and no one's ever seen anything like this happen before so what i didn't realize was there was like sort of a different electric current in the uk <laughs> than we had in the united states so and this this was reading festival 93 or 94 and it's broadcast to the entire country kind of like rage against the machines coming out party we had just had a big hit with Killing the name and bullet in the head, and the nation is riveted on our performance. And I'm like, I'm gonna show them because I got <laughs> shit nobody's seen. So I pull, you know, it's the solo for bullet in the head, and I pull the jack out of the guitar. I step to the front of the stage. <laughs> the camera pans in, and I touch the jack to the thing, expecting it to be like a screeching monkey, you know, making Mozart melodies, and instead it goes. <laughs> anyway, the cameras in my face are like, is that, is that all? Is, is that all? So I sheepishly plug it back in and went back and played a Chuck Berry solo. It all worked out in the end, though. It all worked out. Learn. Let's hear it for tragic failure on a big stage. There you go.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And somehow they still put me on Kerrang! TV all these years later after that <laughs> shameful moment. So as well as the, uh, the guitar wizardry and occasional fluff, <laughs> um, for, you know, from the very beginning, uh, Rage Music was always, always had a very strong message to it, um, which was reflected in all the members sure. of the band, uh, and everyone was you know, all totally on the same page sure. about it. Uh, like where did you start getting interested, or, or where did that stuff sort of start affecting you, the, the need to sort of rise up and actually kick back a bit? Yeah, yeah. It was around when I was four years old. Um, I was the only black kid in an all-white town, and so po you don't have to go looking for politics. Politics finds you on the playground. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had numerous experiences as a little kid in, uh, you know, in daycare centers and on the playground where I just sort of realized that there was a lot that just wasn't right and some people had ideas that were unjust and unfair. And my mom um, is very, ra she's the most radical member of the Morello family. And to her, I'm an arch conservative. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, she taught me lessons at four and at 14 and 40 that, uh, really helped to stoke those flames. Yeah. And when did you, at what point did you start to sort of take it you know, seriously and as a, as a thing that you could do as a, a career? Because you also sure. studied politics. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably around, around the same time I started playing guitar, like 16 or 17 is when I came, you know, I, I sort of matched my, my, my moral art outrage with some sort of real world studying. And uh, with some friends, formed an underground paper at my high school was very inter very interested in international affairs and began sort of hosting protests at the same time I was playing guitar and throughout you know really since the time I was 17 years old the radical politics and the radical guitar playing have interwoven sometimes they've been together and sometimes they've been apart but it, both of them have been a big part of you know my life for you know 40 plus years I mean as did that ever did you ever worry that you know being in a, a band as big as rage became and uh, you know, speaking out on the things that you did and doing some of the things that you did, that you were going to, for want of a better term, get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you're not making music that gets you in trouble, you're probably making shitty music. <laughs> the way I, I look at it, you, if you're making music that everybody can agree on and everybody can say, "Oh, thank you, that was very nice," then I, I, I'm not. I'm not interested in your band. Uh, but no, I, that was never, my bigger worry was being, being able to look myself in the mirror. You know, that's really the, the bigger worry is, is I have strong convictions and I have a vocation uh, of playing the guitar and I've always tried to meld those two things together. And to me, like the, the, the I, I could, I just couldn't live with myself if I compromised who I was to sell a few more records or something like that. That's just not, you know, that's, that's not for me. And how do you feel, you know, after you know, so long, in the game of doing this, um, do you feel, you know, how do you feel things have changed uh, across that time? Because it's been, you know, nearly, I guess, nearly 30 years. Yeah, nearly like 72 years or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, over the, over the course of that, over the course of that time, you know, two things have remained constant. They were also constant before, you know, my first band, and they're likely to be constant long after we're gone, is that there is injustice in the world. And there's also, resistance to injustice and you just have to decide which side you're going to be on and plant your flag and do the best in your place and in your time to stand up against injustice and unjust authority and racism and anti-immigrant sentiment wherever it rears its head and for me it's like like you, I can't separate what I do from who I am and if there's one lesson in any of it is to not is don't leave behind who you are in what you do and so many people kind of like you leave it, you know, whether you're at school or whether you're at a job, you sort of you, you, you dampen down the part of you that might be controversial. You're the part of you that sees someone behaving in a, in a racist or bullying way and just like goes, I don't want to make trouble today. You know, like you just said, there, yeah, you might get in trouble. Yeah, there might be trouble that might happen when you stand up and do the right thing. Well, that's the kind of trouble you should have because it means that you're pushing back against something that's wrong. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And do you feel, uh, you know, at the, at the moment that there's a need for, you know, music that speaks to people on that level, you know, as much, you know, more than ever? Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say there's a need for music that speaks to people on that level. I would say there's a need for people who feel that things are wrong, no matter what their occupation, to step up. Uh, certainly if they're, th as an artist, you have one and only one responsibility, and that's to tell the truth as you see it in the art that you make, whether it's a painting or a movie or a book or a, or a song. Um, 
if there are artists who do not have political convictions, heaven forbid they should pretend to have them because Tom Morello tells them to. Uh, <laughs> if, on the other hand, there are artists that do have political convictions and subsume them because they're afraid of getting in trouble, then there is a very hot place in Dante's Inferno waiting for them. <laughs> Which, if you're metal, might not be so bad. But so that's <laughs> the thing. <laughs> well, um, and I kid, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> As a father now, is this a very important thing to pass on to your, your own children? To avoid Dante's Inferno. Yes, well, yes. At all, by all Crucially, means. yes. By any means necessary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, certainly. You know, I have two boys who are seven and eight, and, you know, and they, they're, they have, hopefully you can instill in them or guide them towards some sort of moral compass where, you know, it's always standing up for the poor, always standing up for the oppressed, always standing up for the underdog, always standing up for yourself, are part of their character. I, you know, I try to, you know, who knows? They'll probably be club promoters or something, and <laughs> 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 they'll be like, "Dad, fuck you! I won't do what you tell me." <laughs> it would serve me right. <laughs> and, um, and what if you could? What would you change, you know, about American government at the moment, other than getting rid of a other than the American government? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can start with that. We can start with that. Uh, I mean, the one thing I'd say is that, is that while, you know, of course, Trump dominates the headlines, that he's, and he's an awful person, he is a distraction. And that the, that the, 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 the true, I mean, there's, I, I could go on, but the, but the systemic problems that gave rise to Trump are at the core of what's going on. And it's, it, was, it existed during the Obama administration, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, is that the drive to enrich the .001% at the expense of working class and middle class people is what has driven people to a level of economic anxiety, both in the United States and in the UK, which has, pro 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 has caused a fertile field for demagogues to use the oldest trick in the book, which is racist divide and rule, and to separate the working class, and oh, it's the Mexicans' fault, oh, it's the Russians' fault, oh, it's the immigrants' fault. It's not their fault. Like, the, the un any undocumented worker and a white working class person in Alabama have much more in common about their needs for themselves and their families with each other than they do with Donald Trump. And yet somehow there's been this sand thrown in our eyes because, you know, it's, it's, it, it's racism is the oldest scapegoat in the book. And you, you see it here with your, like, Brexit and that shit. It's like, it's, it's a trick. But, but the, if you don't recognize the underlying problems, there'll only continue to be this kind of division uh, between right and left, between uh, white and brown, as opposed to the division there should be, which is between us and them. Very well said. And with such things in mind, do you think that the world needs Rage Against the Machine to come back right now? <laughs> I'd say I have a counter proposal. Um, <laughs> first of all, if Rage Against the Machine comes back, count me and I know the songs. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say rather than sitting around weeping and moaning and whining about Rage Against the Machine, come back, form your own fucking band and write your own killing in the name and write your own Know Your Enemy and write your own Bolt in the Head because that's what I've done. I've written my own The Atlas Underground and that, and that in, I use my breath and my power and the beating of my heart and the creativity of my hands and my brick throwing fists to try to change the world the way that I can change it today rather than sort of mythologizing a great band that doesn't exist like let's all do something now so not download next year <laughs> less whining more rocking people and, uh, <laughs> as well as the sort of very as you say your brick throwing fist that mm. was part of Raging Against the Machine another thing about it that's always seen is that there seem to be this sort of slight glee in pissing off the right people and they're you know uh, the sleep down the fire video being a very sure, good example sure, sure, sure. of just getting the wind up people who really deserve to be pissed off yeah yeah there is glee in that you got that right man <laughs> it's super gleeful to piss off the bad guys i will tell you a story about the sleep now in the fire video which um perhaps you don't know there are two stories one is michael moore directed the video and um and in it, he made some placards for people to hold as they were going by. One of them, incredibly, and you can check the tape, one of them says, Donald Trump for President 2000, in that video. So we were some, somehow Nostradamus-like in that prediction, <laughs> and perhaps share in some responsibility, and I apologize. Um, um, but the other yeah, thing... Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
so we were, I, I was a big fan of, of Mike's, and his new movie is fantastic. I saw it the other day, so please go see it. But uh, he, he just had such balls at everything that he did, and he was so confrontational and so fearless in um, fearless in like heading into places where he did not belong and did not have a permit to shoot. So I, I couldn't wait to meet him and ask him. I had one question to ask him. So he comes in the trailer and like, Mike, great to meet you, huge fan. Um, how many times have you been arrested? And he said, I've never been arrested. And I jokingly said, oh, well, you've never worked with Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> Cut to 90 minutes later. <laughs> so we had a permit to film on the f uh, steps of the federal building in, by the New York Stock Exchange. We did not have a permit to film on the city-owned streets. So we're this is going to burst your bubble, too. Like, when bands make videos, they're not really playing. They're <laughs> miming along to a playback that's occurring. That comes in. That's an important. Keep that in mind. That's important later. So, so Mike gives us only one directorial instruction in the early part. He says, no matter what happens, keep playing. I'm like, that should be easy enough. So they hit playback on the thing. We begin rocking and miming the the day traders are walking by. We do a couple of takes, and he says, now we're going to go down to the sidewalk where we don't have a permit. But he says, no matter what happens, keep playing. So we're down on the sidewalk. Playback begins again, and a New York City police sergeant comes up to me and over the din says, you can't be down here. You got to go back on the steps. And I remember what my director told me. No matter what happens, <laughs> and this is like a happening that's happening when he comes over, keep playing. So I keep playing. He's like, now he's mad because he, I'm defying him. He's like, get, you get off the sidewalk. Get off the sidewalk. Get off the fucking sidewalk. And I'm like, I keep playing because I trust Mike. And he's super mad that now I've double defied him. So he reaches down and he unplugs my guitar. And my guitar doesn't stop <laughs> because it's playback that's playing. And he takes a step back like, I, like I'm a wizard. <laughs> and he, <laughs> see, because he didn't get the speech about the play. So he, and he's like, <sighs> so he reaches over and unplugs Tim's bass. <laughs> and the bass doesn't stop. And now he's in the company of multiple wizards. <laughs> so he reaches over and grabs. Brad's drumsticks, and the drums don't stop. <laughs> and the look on his face, he's so mad and yet so afraid <laughs> that he somehow found himself in this coven of warlocks. And uh, <laughs> so he has to arrest somebody, and he's not going to arrest the warlocks because clearly we've got some on him. So he arrests Michael Moore. And <laughs> And as he's dragged, as Michael is handcuffed, it's all in the video, as Michael is handcuffed and being dragged away up the steps, he turns over his shoulder and gives his second directorial cue of the afternoon, which is, take the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> and I'm like, take the New York Stock Exchange? All right. So, <laughs> so we put down our guitars and we march through the doors of the New York Stock Exchange during the middle of day trading. And there's a, you know, some poor little security guard in there who's not expecting rage against the machine to come through the doors. And I say, I'm here to take the New York Stock Exchange. Is that a left or a right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he calls the guards and the riot police come and they expel us from the building and they shut down the building and they pull the riot doors down. And it's the first and the only time that the New York Stock Exchange has closed during the middle of the day and Rage Against the Machine and Michael Moore stopped capitalism dead in its tracks on a Tuesday afternoon. And that's Tuesday. <laughs> Black Tuesday. Very well done. <laughs> Just another day at the office. So after all that kind of madness and you know, quite angry music, I guess, from Raising Against Machine. When Audio Slave started, was it yeah. nice to do something slightly more mellow? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't call it nice, and I wouldn't call it necessarily mellow. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, rocking songs there, too. But each, any band, in order for it to be gr to the, be the best that it can be, has to be authentic and has to find what it was. Like, when we formed Audio Slave, I was determined that Audio Slave was going to be a heavier and more political band than Rage Against the Machine. So I didn't think we were enough of either of those in Rage, in Rage really. Um, but then I found that there was just, like, it was a different vibe, and I couldn't sort of impose, couldn't fit, you know, like a round peg into a square hole. And I was like, okay, let's just see what we really are. And once we did that, then the songs just came. And it was allowing 
Chris's great vocals were allowed us to to uh, push Tim, Tim Brad and I into more melodic directions, into more chords. There's not like one chord change in any song of Rage Against the Machine, not one, because we rely on like the James Brown formula. It always comes back to the one, like big riffs too. It always comes back to the one. Um, but with Chris's vocals, in order for them to be free and flying and beautiful like they are, it requires that kind of harmonic interplay between his melody and the underlying chords, which led to songs like Like a Stone and I Am the Highway and some really beautiful songs that uh, he was such a huge part of. Yeah. And um, obviously, as you, you said earlier, quite rightly, one of the, the greatest singers of, you know, of his generation mm -hmm. in, in rock history. I and mean, what was it like to stand on stage with, with someone like that who can really do the things that he did with just a bit of his neck. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. You know, and the thing is, like, Chris never sang very loud, too. I don't know if you know, like, he, the, even those crazy wailing Soundgarden things, it was in a, almost like a conversational volume. Um, it was great. It made, like, uh, it, we, we took it for granted, too. Like, I've, like I said, I've been so blessed to, to play with some of the best front people in the history of rock and roll. Like, we just, you know, Zach, who I believe is probably the greatest front man. You know, he's like the punk rock James Brown. There's no one, <laughs> no one more intense on stage in the history of rock than that guy. And then we went to, like, the greatest singer. So, Tim and Brad are like, yeah, we get the good shit. You know, like, it's a... <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so with Chris, it was just, it was so effortless for him that, in a way, we took it for granted. Like, we just, with anything you threw at him, whether it was a complicated, heavy riff, or whether it was... Uh, a very simple chord progression, he would m make it into a beautiful song or, or f furious song, effortlessly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, obviously, you've been playing uh, some audio slave stuff with Prophets of Rage. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I mean, how does it feel to be playing it, you know, without him there, singing it with, with having the other guys sing yeah, it? Yeah. Well, we n well the other guys don't sing it. We do it with we do it as a as an uh, in memory of him. And a couple times, Serge Tanky in his song "Like a Stone." Yeah. But for the most part, we just turn the microphone. We turn a light light on the empty microphone. We let the crowd sing, and we celebrate his life together. That's how we do it. Good. Cool. Yeah. What was cooler? Having Christmas number one with Killing in the Name, or mm. being not once but twice in Star Trek. <laughs> That's a dead heat, bro. <laughs> I was I was pretty sure that it was going to be the Christmas number one till you hit me with the Star Trek. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I would say that only one of those was a dream come true. <laughs> the other was a wonderful and unexpected surprise. So. And how does one get involved in being in Star Trek? <laughs> uh, cashing in chips would be <laughs> one way. <laughs> you find a producer or director whose son's a big Rage Against the Machine fan is what you do. That's what you do. <laughs> cool. And, um, <laughs> and finally, what do you think is, you know, as someone who's helped shape the landscape of rock music, uh, you know, several times really, what do you think of you know where rock music is in 2018? I think it's time to do it again. <laughs> Honestly, that's why I made this record. I didn't this. I didn't make this. Re I made this record with very lofty sonic ambitions, which was to create a new genre of music. Because in my view, rock rock and roll is ignored by the chart. It's like kids now just want Ableton and a computer, and they become kind of composers without ever playing an instrument, which is fine. And I've, if music is entirely subjective. There's a lot of great music that's made that way. But I want, this record is a Trojan horse. This record carries two things on it which they do not want at, on, the, you know, on the charts. One is a kick-ass electric guitar. The other is unapologetic political content. This record has both of those, but it also has like people like Portugal the Man and like Marcus Mumford who are used to being at the, you know, in the charts. So the Trojan horse is rolling in, and as soon as it's through the door, look out, because shit's going to get heavy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Tom, thank you very, very much. Hey, thank you very much for having me. You've been a <laughs> thoughtful questioner and audience. Death to false metal. <laughs> and we'll thank see you, you around. Much, 2019, we'll be touring the Atlas Underground, and Profits will be back, so we'll uh, see you there for all that. All right. <laughs>